Um, today's session is all about successful marketing to schools. We try to design this event to be relaxed and conversational, and we've brought together a selection of people who are involved in this space, with the idea being that we can really get insights from a collection of perspectives to help people get, um, help people to get, get to grips um, with the best techniques and approaches. So do make most of the amazing people we have in the room with us today and ask questions from our panelists um, uh, using the Q&A function. This is the, uh, the format we're going to be following today. We'll start with introductions from our panelists. Then we'll go on to um, some discussions around current trends and positioning. Um, we'll take a five minute break. And then after the break, we'll come back and have a discussion around opportunities and challenges. And after that, the panel will share their practical top tips uh, around marketing. And, um, and we'll finish up with um, some time for some Q&A at the end. Right, let's turn off my screen share now. And um, we'll, we'll start with the introductions. Very warm welcome to Julia, Oliver, Isabel and Gary. Thanks so much for your time today. Um, Oliver, would you like to kick off the introductions and tell us a bit about yourself? Um, thanks. So I'm Oliver Scott. I'm the Artistic Director of Mercurial Dance. So I'm based in Coventry, which is Coventry City of Culture, um, this year for another six months as well. Um, and our work is structured really around three core strands. Um, we create experiences or shows uh, that we tour to the outs outdoor arts, and they're sometimes site-specific. Uh, we uh, run educational workshops uh, and participatory projects with young people and then running through all of these experiences are digital which is first and foremost all sort of our strategy for the next three years uh, and our digital engagement looks at XR that's mixed reality augmented reality uh, and, and kind of games development are that we're working on at the moment um, and we're quite interested in how um, uh, artistically really how we can start to make work that is digital dance and other forms for these platforms as opposed to just sort of streaming content um, and this journey really sort of accelerated I think for most of us uh, last year when we moved our education program online uh, creating webinars and starting to look at how we could start to link the children that we, that we work and serve um, to different journeys so such as signposting them to different galleries internationally around that um, so that's sort of a, a brief really brief introduction to what we do at the moment. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Oliver. Um, oh, who should we go to next? Uh, uh, Julia, would you like to go next? I will, yeah. So my name's Julia Lawrence and I'm an associate for Festival Bridge. I lead on their work around digital learning, which includes support for local organisations in developing their digital offer for schools. I've worked across both arts and education sectors and for 19 years I co-led an organisation, London Connected Learning Centre, that sold packages of support to schools, so around the use of technology, both in the computing curriculum, but across the curriculum and in art subjects. So I have experience of doing the hard graft of, of trying to sell and promote um, content and, and services for schools. I'm now back working in the art sector where I started my career many years ago, and I'm mostly working around sort of digital learning and support for organisations in creating good digital learning content. So that's me. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Julia. OK, Gary, it's your turn. Uh, thank you, Roberta. Hi, everybody. I'm Gary Futcher. I'm program lead for education at Real Ideas. So we're one of the 10 Arts Council bridge organisations uh, and we look after the South West. Um, in a previous life, I had over 20 years as uh, an English and drama teacher uh, and latterly as a secondary head teacher. Uh, but strange enough, very before that, very back a long time ago, I started out as a publicity officer in a repertory theatre. And it's that long ago, it was spray mount and cutting boards and scalpels uh, rather than anything digital. Uh, thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Gary. And Isabel, finally, let's, let's, uh, let's hear from you. Hello, I'm Isabel Stevens, the head teacher at Newland School. And hello to people from Penzance. I've seen you popping up on the chat there. Um, people who don't know Penzance, we're right down at the bottom of the country. It's very beautiful down here. Uh, also, though, uh, really high level of deprivation in certain areas. So my school uh, has a feeder estate. 50% uh, of my children come from that school and they're in the bottom 10% of deprivation uh, in the whole of Europe. They're also geo 
geographically deprived in many ways because uh, they can't get out because they can't afford cars, they can't afford um, buses, trains. So they're pretty much trapped in the bottom of the country, uh, which say it's a lovely place to be, but means there's a real lack of understanding about what's out there. And actually it's quite culturally uh, deprived in many ways. Um, so one of the reasons that I've hugely focused on art is uh, Newlyn Art Galleries at the bottom of the road. And we did some work which had a really high impact on the children's self-esteem and self-worth which made me appreciate just how much art brings to, to children and the importance of it. And added to that, COVID has made us all realise, I think, the importance of children's well-being. Uh, children enjoy art, enjoy art activities, and I firmly believe it should be at the very centre of our school curriculum. Thank you. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Isabel. That's, that's great. Um, there's such a, a, a good collection of us here with different insights. I'm, I think it's going to be a great chat today. So let's dive right in and talk about um, current trends and opportunity and uh, positioning, sorry, current trends and positioning. Um, and I'm going to direct my first question to Gary. Um, in your role, Gary, as a bridge programme lead for education and arts, Mark, what trends are you seeing at present? Uh, thanks, Roberta. Uh, I, I, part of that is just echoing what Isabel's just said. I think um, I think health and well-being, um, very very straightforward. Thinking about kind of coming through COVID and, and into a post, if there is such a thing as a post-COVID world, um, health and well-being is hugely important. Uh, and I'm seeing definitely schools really interested again in arts and culture for the part they can play in supporting health and well-being. And, and that's not only health and well-being for young people. And I think, you know, that's clearly a driver. I think one of the bits is it's also health and well-being for staff and health and well-being for communities as well. So for some of that, that is really a, a definite driver. I think the second thing, because it doesn't go away, uh, and if you picked up the news the last couple of days, uh, it's never going away. Ofsted is a driver. Um, the Ofsted framework, as it is now, which is very much focused on curriculum and is very much focused on knowledge and skills progression and sequencing of knowledge and skills, that is definitely a preoccupation for schools. They are definitely looking at ways that they can be really robust about the progression of knowledge in, in, in art, in music and so on. So I think that's a, you know, a real, real driver. Um, and alongside that those those preoccupations for schools in terms of what is pushing them along um, I think there is also a space in terms of that resurgence or, or a growing interest in skills and what arts and culture can do in terms of skills particularly creativity um, I think the new um, creativity exchange that the Arts Council have put up which is kind of supporting schools to think about creative education and approaches to creativity is a real real strength so those three strands for me that that remorselessness around Ofsted health and well-being and then skills such as creativity they're real drivers uh, that I'm seeing at the moment. Oh that's really interesting do you, do you think the the health and well-being um, part, uh, uh, piece of that is um, a lot to do with Covid and and or do you think that's just something that's that's happening um, because it would have happened anyway? No, I think I think it's COVID and I think it's an increase in when we, health and well-being, definitely around mental health and the place arts. Lots and lots of schools that I've been in contact with and work with saw the value of keeping arts and culture alive and that they were really important in helping maintain connection and positivity and positive kind of attitudes and mental health across lockdown. And they don't want to lose that as, as they move forward. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks, Gary. I'm going to turn to Isabel now. Um, how do you, Isabel, how do you research or uh, what route do you go down to find things for your school generally? What's, what's your pattern of behaviour, do you think? It's actually, it's quite interesting because I moved down to Cornwall about three and a half years ago and I found it really hard to find anything to do with art. Um, bearing in mind what a wonderful area it is to art, for art down here. So um, I didn't have the relationships that I think when you're at school for a long time, one of the area that you have. Um, and I found it really difficult 
to to get in contact with sort of people who are out there. So that's I think that's quite interesting for people to you know I, I we want to know what's going on. We want to find be able to get that sort of information quite easily. Um, I managed to get information by just because I could walk down to Newlyn Art Gallery and we began a relationship there, and they then shared information with me. And since then, other information, other um, communication has gone out. So I started to be contacted by um, some local groups where they're running initiatives in the area. And I've also taken on now, I'm the art lead for uh, TPAT, which is the academy I'm part of. So that's 29 schools as well. So even oh, amazing. If, yeah, so even if people can let me know what's going on, um, I can then share that information with other schools because Cornwall's a large county, so it might be more appropriate for other schools further up. But actually finding that information out was quite tricky. I think generally the way that I, I find things out is through other schools and what they're doing, which is quite difficult for people who uh, haven't managed to get into a school because you haven't got that relationship. So I will hear about something, for instance, I heard about a wonderful uh, music teacher who was doing sort of well-being behavior work in the Amazing. playground. I appointed her, um, she came in and did uh, a terms work with me. It was fantastic with the children. And then of course, through my word of mouth, then she's gone and worked with other TPAT schools and local schools. So it's trying to get in in the first place, I think. And it's working out who the best person is to contact because with the best school of the world, I probably get a hundred emails a day. I know. With, it's just... with people offering me things. And just as Gary said, if it if it doesn't tick a curriculum box at the moment or doesn't tick something, um, I, I will just delete it because I haven't got time to read a hundred emails. It's got to be something that is really relevant to the school. Uh, it's got to be something that's going to save us time. And also I have to say, if it's something that is um going to take a lot of time uh, I'd have to think extremely carefully about it because with the combination of trying to manage a school during Covid uh, and there is still Covid in schools whatever whatever they're saying uh trying to manage that and try and bring in the new expectations for Ofsted is uh, just the most huge pressure so what you need yeah. to offer is something that's quick an easy fix for a school and they think yes I can do that that would be great and that would tick tick the box curriculum wise as well um brochures are very good i have to say because a brochure yeah, expense, expensive i know but i tend to sort of put them in a pile and then every now and again i'll have a flick through and go oh yeah no that looks good so that that's quite a good way in yeah and, and I, I imagine like things like brochures end up in the staff room and things like that for people to thumb through and breaks and things so yeah and, and they get shared yeah. with staff so for instance I don't know it's about a Roman dance or something I'd just pop it to the person who's doing Romans and uh you know and she might decide that that that's appropriate to use for the curriculum so it's a better way of sharing probably better than emails that's amazing thanks thanks Isabel um let's move on to the next question then for Gary um what do you think the best way to, to build a relationship with the school is? I think Isabel's given you some really, really good ins there. I think that that, that notion of word of mouth, that notion of something that's relevant um, and, and fits with what schools are doing. And that's not to compromise your own um, content or artistic process or, or what you want to do, but just that understanding that if you want to work with schools, it needs to fit. My experience, there are two things that are really important in terms of contact with school. One is a contact name that's a real person. So not, I suppose we have the problem often with info app boxes in schools and getting past the info app box, but equally for an arts organization, if you've got a named person, one of the values for Artsmark partners, for example, we always talk about is making sure whatever offer you have for Artsmark schools, that you have a named person that somebody can contact. Because often the first bit is just being able to talk to somebody. I might not want to book. I might not quite know what I want or whether the thing you've got is quite the thing I need to suit my school. But I'd love to have a conversation with somebody, a named person who can kind of help just give me that bit of advice and guidance. I think that's really hugely important. The second thing, again, is where you've just made me really think about it. And this is a bit tongue in cheek. If you can provide finance or transport, then you're on a winner. Um, if you, at the end of the day in our patch, if you want to do anything, 
you might have the ticket cost first and then you've got the coach cost on top and suddenly you're looking at costs that just push it beyond the bounds of lots of families and lots of schools. So anything you can do in that space, I think is a winner. That's brilliant. Or maybe in school um, events and stuff like that where it's not a trip, especially. Amazing. Can I just add in there that it is actually yeah, sure. schools are under huge, huge financial pressures at the moment. And, uh, you know, on top of paying a lot of money now for supply teachers because uh, teachers are off, obviously isolating and off poorly and things. Um, and we've had we've taken quite a hit with COVID. So there are huge financial pressures which have to come into every consideration. That's a really good point. Thanks. Thanks, Isabel. Um, OK, so that segues nicely into my next question for you, Isabel. What types of sessions are you interested in post lockdown? Are they virtual or in person or um, away day type stuff? What kinds of things? I, I think I think the move to virtual has meant um, you can probably reach out to education much more easily now. Um, I know, for instance, uh, when I did the arts mark training originally, what put me off doing that, the first initial uh, introduction was that it meant two members of staff out of school all day. Um, so that meant two members of staff supply costs, the traveling costs, and actually what happened was we could do it virtually. So it meant I could save that money and just pay the cost of doing the art mark instead, which is why we made the decision to go ahead with it at the time. So I, I think virtual, um, you're more likely to get people and I'm starting to find that a lot of the timings seem to be sort of four till five seem to suit a lot of people because they're still at work. Um, so it's not late in the evening, but you're not having to come out of class. So it's saving a lot of money on supply costs. I guess that ticks a lot of box for health and safety as well and things like that. And, um, you know, a lot of the other problems you might run into. Um, do you find that schools are pooling their um, events or is it is it just, um, you know, one on one school events that are happening? It, it absolutely depends, um, you know, because I'm part of a large academy, sometimes it can be really useful to pool events um, and to sort of bring together lots of people um, because that, that way it's much cheaper and we can all share the cost. Yeah, I was going to say, it's very cost effective that way, isn't it? So it's quite a good strategy to maybe think about as well. Fantastic. Right. That brings us nicely into, I think we're going to, I'm going to close that uh, section down now, that, that part of the discussion. That was, that was really brilliant. Um, we're going to have a five minute break now and um, you can all go and get a cup of tea and um, I will see you all back here at um, uh, 25 past. I'll, put, I'll share my screen. Feel free to turn your cameras off and go and get a cup of tea.
just uh, bring you all back in now because it's 25 past. Uh, Waiting everyone to turn back on their cameras. So, welcome back. I'll just give you a few seconds for everyone to, to come back in. And um, I'll move the, the talk on now to uh, a conversation about opportunities and challenges. Just make sure everybody's back in the room. Yeah. Um, is everybody back? Yeah, cool. Oliver, I'd like to start with you for this uh, to kick this one off. Um, what are your approaches when you're marketing to schools? Um, thanks, Roberta. I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question in a way, because uh, for us, we work on a project basis. We're not an NPO. Um, we've got a long term relationship that we have with uh, a lead primary school and then the other academies around it. Um, and so actually marketing for us is often a custom custom approach. Um, and first and foremost, it, it, I find I'm, I'm usually thinking about directly phoning people, um, contacting them and trying to find out as um, uh, Gary was saying about finding the right person to contact. Um, so I often take a direct a kind of a, what you might call a, a direct sales approach in some ways or something around that, that sort of speaks to that partnership development around marketing. Um, but across other platforms and different experiences, then, uh, you know, if you're looking at when we've got a show on tour or whether we've got a new piece of work, then we're starting to use more of those digital mechanisms like MailChimp um, or email marketing and those sorts of those sorts of aspects to kind of start to develop it. I think a lot of our work, particularly around participation and around work in primary schools, usually is quite in depth and, and long to, longer term. So there's a sense of that being built into the whole project and the partnership development almost before we start to raise the funds to, to have got to that point to be reaching people and working with them. Oh, that's brilliant. And do you, do you find that um, people respond well to, the, uh, to your email marketing or, or which ones do you think, which ways do you think people respond the best to? Um, uh, I'm personally, I like, uh, I find I like networking. So in the Midlands, we've got some, some of the venues host kind of, uh, and arts connect as well. The bridge organization host, um, uh, kind of what, or previously vir now virtual, which I go to less, but the, the face-to-face -face meetings where schools uh, and arts networks and artists can come together and discuss things. Um, I find that quite powerful. So you're sort of unable to start to find the conversations and I think find out what the needs are as well earlier on in terms of what we're doing. Email marketing, it, it can be hit and miss. As you know, it's quite easy for stuff to go into spam uh, in that kind of way. Yeah. Um, and also sometimes, although, although you know, you, you, you sometimes get clicks or, or referrals, you can track stuff to a certain extent. Um, it's not always what you want it to be. So again, it's sort of, I guess we design our marketing on a project to project basis, you know, around specific specific things. Um, and so there's sort of, no, I never try, try and have a one size fits all around that. And I also kind of think about marketing also being as much around what happens and how we communicate during a project as it is in that kind of establishing and that setting up of the project yeah. through it. So there's sort of like, there are kind of different layers to what sort of marketing is really when we approach it, which is how we set it up and then how we communicate communicate and then how we tell the story and so we'd use the different you know as everyone does really use social media to be telling those stories and otherwise then post event as well around videos or things that we might have edited together to then keep that story and that narrative going because sometimes you have to keep with people for quite a long time particularly as an organization that sort of initiates projects before we find the resources to then come back and take that next step with them um, if it's if it's a project where we're sort of serving areas of need or finding the funding to deliver that kind of work. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I guess that's right. And it, it, it depend on the relationship you've had with them before, whether that you're new to them or whether um, you've, you, they've been to things that you've done before. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Oliver. Um, over to you now, Julia. Um, what channels do you think organisations um, should, should, should organisations use to reach out to schools, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, I think schools are pretty good users of social media, not all schools, but many schools yeah. are pretty good users. So, you know, and social media allows you to bypass some of those obstacles that you've been talking about, you know, the generic admin address or, you know, the tricky reception staff, you know, what, what, whatever it is. And it allows you to engage direct with the school or direct with the individual. I think the best channel to engage with schools is probably Twitter. And the best channel to engage with individuals is both Twitter and Facebook groups. 
So with Twitter, I've got some top tips that I'm going to rattle through. Um, so again, Brilliant. research, research the schools in your area with Twitter accounts. So poke around in the Twitter accounts of others who are doing similar and, you know, nick their contacts. Always ask for Twitter handles when you're getting school details. Add it in as another um, as another box. Have a dedicated school's Twitter account if possible. I know this isn't always possible, but it makes such a difference to have one that's just dedicated to schools and to teachers and cuts through other noise and allows them to just access your content for them. If you have that, then make it busy, you know, be active. Uh, as Olive, Oliver said, you know, don't just um, share the stuff you're trying to sell, share the learning journeys, you know, make the stuff that's on your website real, show classrooms so that teachers can see a classroom like theirs and think, oh, this could be for me. Um, ask questions, use prompts, make it um, two way. Use hashtags. Education community are really big on, on hashtag chats. There's an SLT chat on a Sunday evening, a governor chat on a Sunday evening, and there's a really big one on a Thursday called UK Ed Chat. Hashtag UK Ed Chat. If you look at their Twitter account, it has about 80,000 followers on the main account. And, you know, they're not all engaging in every chat, but, you know, many are. And it's a good way to sort of listen into conversations. So what's keeping a head teacher awake at night? Listen into Amazing. that because you could be the solution and you can frame your work in, you know, whatever that is. Facebook groups. Yeah. <laughs> and Facebook groups are good for that, too. I'm quite a big fan of um, education Facebook groups. They've got them for per phase and per subject area. There are loads of arts ones. Um, I've been doing a bit of work with a brilliant theatre company in Southend called Enact. They uh, were a member of various drama Facebook groups, um, just kind of listening in to some of the conversations, but they started their own at the beginning of lockdown to help drama teachers deliver the subject in the distanced classroom. But they now have 1.7 thousand teachers, you know, way beyond the Amazing. number they were reaching in real life. And they're able to share resources with them, but also they're a massive resource for the for the organization to develop stuff with, to chat through things with, and hopefully to sell content to. Um, yeah. I think a couple of people asked about TikTok, but I think that's one to keep off just at the moment. There've been some tricky things going on in the education yeah. sector with TikTok. So keep away from that. Look at Twitter and Facebook. Fantastic. That's absolute gold. Thank you, Julia. Um, I, I imagine um, we might be able to get a list of hashtags that might people might want to research at, at some point. Yeah, um, I, I can put a link. There's um, Festival Bridge produced yeah. a guide and it's got some information about Twitter and education hashtags. So I'll, I'll Fantastic. share the link. That'd be amazing. And Roberta, it, it just, just it, it's really worth saying, um, you know, I've been out of, um, of formal education and teaching for a couple of years now, but I use Twitter an awful lot professionally to keep up to date with the current themes, trends, issues. Um, and that, for me, if you've got the time and place to do that, and, and that's coming from somebody now working with an arts organisation, that's hugely important. It keeps you in touch with what's there and therefore enables yeah. you to shape um, your offer appropriately. Amazing. Yeah, that's that's such great advice from both of you. Thank you. Yeah, I think just picking up on that and um, one of the uh, around social media and one of the questions coming in from 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 Meg um, there about so do you feel social media has the merit for advertising to teachers and schools? I mean, social media advertising is kind of an interesting area. And what we found certainly recently with launching less for schools but more for general audiences is that it's 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 harder to get native content. You know, sort of the general posts and profiles to get that through and that actually the, the the platforms are starting to shift so that actually it's more the advertising spend that you put out there. and for relatively little money i mean i think you know you can reach a lot of people by spending 20 to 30 quid so it's quite i find it's quite an interesting way of experimenting so putting an advert up there putting some target words out there with it and then sort of seeing where that goes or what sort of courages go so you can sort of use it as a process around developing and learning and seeing what times of day you think are the right time to do that um, in that kind of way. That's another fantastic tip and it kind of segues into my next question to you Oliver. Um, what, where, where do you see that the opportunities and challenges of, of marketing to schools are? Um, well, I think, you know, part of it is we're all sort of here because it's quite hard, actually, to be perfectly honest. You know, the, the schools have busy people who have full agendas of, of things they're doing. And, and outside that, 
you know, we as artists have have things, services that we want to sell and, and, and generate revenue from and, and, and have our business models around that. And so I, I, I do find it can be hard to reach people, particularly if you've got a, you know, you've got your, my, you know, we've got our killer project that we just know is really going to transform and really help the young people that we want to work with, because that's yeah. ultimately who we're serving. Um, but I suppose part of one of the things that we'd like to do across all of the marketing as an organization, and we're, we're a small organization sort of just stepping. So we're occasionally we'll have a marketing support who delivers that for us. And occasionally other times it's sort of down to me who posts and doesn't post and, and those sorts of things. So it sort of expands and contracts according to where we are in our, our journeys a little bit sometimes the analytics are quite helpful um, uh, uh, around that as an opportunity to sort of understand a bit better where it's going um, and then sort of platforms if you like we use use of that um, I think other opportunities a little bit is like is is there's there's a question about this I always have which is about the marketplace what is the need you know if schools are constantly under pressure financially then there's a pressure you know that that comes back to you know do we then have to find the funding as artists to go into schools to do the work that we need to do so that that sort of starts to speak a little bit more to this ecology if you like or this dynamic around these this sort of partnership yeah. which we find as, as a route through but i think you know i definitely think sort of longer term uh, the opportunities that we find if you like around that is where um where those conversations can build. So for example, we've got a lead school that we work with, it started with an arts project that we found the resources for and a, and a timely meeting with a, with a colleague. And then over time that built, so now we deliver the entire PPA program for them. So the bar budget for the artists is within the staffing structure. So we don't have to find additional funds for it. Art is there for its own sake as its own curriculum and creative development for the children. And it's led by artists that we work with it. But that didn't, you know, I, I think that would be a hard thing to market and jump into a school and say, hey, we can do all your PPA for you without sort of having had that track record um, and that partnership. So at one point, I think we've probably submitted maybe over, half, maybe over half a million pounds worth of funding proposals around the community centre and the part and the school sense. around what we're doing. So that's where I find sort of for us, marketing is also it's about relationship development and yeah. it can, can take a long time. And it's about that relationship development also fitting with where we're at as an organization around our business objectives. Ultimately, you know, does it fit in yeah. what we what we want to be doing next? Does it benefit the people we work with alongside the organization to be putting time into finding this funding and, and making that happen? And so, it, you know, yeah. in those sorts of contexts, yeah, marketing opportunities can get the opportunities and challenges yeah. can get so a little bit more nuanced or a little bit more complicated. Yeah, that that's brilliant. I'm going to have to move move on now because uh, I, I don't want to run out of time. But um, I'm going to go on to Julia and ask, what's the place of and purpose of a digital offer for schools now, and how can we ensure digital offers don't diminish in-person bookings? Yeah, OK, well, I, I guess we all know so much more about what works best IRL and what works best in on in the digital space and, you know, what we never want to go back to um, in the digital space. So we're not going to be producing a digital experience when we know that real life is, is far superior. So I think, you know, we need to focus on where digital gives us an advantage and where the benefits are and where that's likely to be for most people where it augments or enhances that live experience. So that might be um, stuff that I'm sure lots of you have done, you know, producing resources or as Isabel said, you know, running online teacher training sessions or giving access to spaces or people that it's not possible to give access to yeah. in the real world, like, you know, archivists or archives that are too small to get a class into, et cetera. So it's kind of like the bonus material on your DVD <laughs> back in the <laughs> day. That's a really good way of putting it. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, yeah. that's not good. That's not going to drive sales, but it keeps that relationship going that we've been talking yeah. about. You know, that it's, that's really crucial. But I know that some organisations have had real success in creating and selling a digital offer and putting that alongside their, um, their real life offer. So it's good to have a look at the Jewish Museum. Um, uh, GEM, who are the Heritage Museum Heritage Organisation, produced um, a case study um, pamphlet. Uh, I think it's issue number 26. I'll put it in the chat. And the Jewish Museum talk about their virtual workshop programme. So they started shifting their offer online. They developed a virtual version of what they did in real life and they started selling it, straight away selling it, some to their existing audience, but also to a new audience. So they began to develop and shift Amazing. beyond their locality. So yeah. it's really interesting to look at their journey because now that sits alongside their face-to-face -face offer. So it's just one thing that they offer and it's a new income stream for them. 
There's one final thing I want to say is that I was chatting to an arts organization the other day and we were talking about the potential of digital. And she said, we need to get away from, from or help schools to get away from thinking that, you know, digital is just a stopgap until we can get back to the real stuff. You know, the digital is the real stuff too. And it has benefits for pupils and for teachers, as Isabel talked about, you know, with the professional development. So we need to promote it as such, you know, that, that's, that's our job now. And I should say there is emerging evidence of what's been successful from the school sector. So if there's time, I can talk about that later. That's amazing. Thanks, Julia. Wow, what a brilliant conversation so far. It's been so insightful. Um, I'm going to move us on now to the to the to the final section of um, before we get onto the Q and A. And I've, I've noticed we've got a huge amount of bumper crop of Q and A uh, to get through. So um, I'll I'll go around the group now and uh, um, get some top tips, top uh, practical marketing tips from everyone. Um, Julia, what do you think? Uh, uh, what what are your top tips for reach, reaching the decision makers in schools? Uh, that's a hard question, really hard, but I'm going to echo what Gary said. It's, you know, it's research and know your patch. As Gary said, schools are really different. And I think it's really important to know that the infrastructure is now really complicated in English schools. So we have ones that are, uh, you know, local authority controlled, and we have others that come under multi-academy trusts. And some of those have two schools and some of those have 70 schools and some share a curriculum and some don't. So you kind of need to know what's in your area. So it's a bit of hard graft, you know, find out who your schools are and then, you know, find out who the decision makers are. And, and sometimes that decision maker is just the arts lead. You need them to say yes. But if you want to work at scale and, you know, supply something at scale to a number of schools, you need to be able to go higher up that chain. That so sense. it's finding out about that uh, and then as Gary said again you know research what their priorities are I, is it mental health and well-being is it still covid you know is it catch what, what what's 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 the deal for them and how can you be the solution um i think the key thing that again has already been mentioned and if i worked anywhere near isabel i'd be pouncing on you isabel <laughs> you sound like a great head teacher in your area is using head teacher advocates so anyone that's done work with you that likes your work and can spread the word it's certainly when we were selling to schools having those advocates who did the heavy lifting for us in that area was invaluable we couldn't have done it without them so that's my tip. amazing top tip there thank you um, Gary, can you tell me your top tip for creating relevant and useful services for schools? Okay, I think it's um, start where they're at. You need to know that bit about where schools are at. Um, you know, we've talked about health and wellbeing, but think about curriculum. If, if you're thinking about the curriculum that, that schools have to deliver, then finding hooks that link into those curriculum areas. And I'm not just talking about, you know, art, music, dance and drama. Actually, there's a lot of arts and cultural activity that can fit into history, geography and so on. So it's thinking about Science, where you yeah. can link into curriculum if you've got those opportunities. It's not the be all and end all, but it helps. We're doing workshops this week um, down in Plymouth for schools. They're around light. They're not they're not a school lesson. They are a workshop and they're a springboard for thinking about um, light and projection and, and those sorts of things that schools and teachers can then carry on in their classrooms. So finding those things that might just help that journey and help the teacher make the progress, that's the key for me. Fantastic, thank you, Gary. Um, moving on. Um, <clears throat> Oliver, tell us, tell us what your top tip is. Um, top tips, I suppose, I mean, picking up on the previous, uh, on, on Gary and, and Julia, I think, you know, research is part of marketing um, that's the first thing so finding out what my offer is and how it meets with somebody else's need and finding and trying to find that quickly because when it doesn't fit it's like fine let's find someone who does fit and, and move on because there's sort of a synthesis there that needs to happen and um, i think there's something about um uh, uh around marketing research to jump around so we use there's things like um uh, um uh, follow a wonk and things like that that can give you some analytical data from from how you're tracking and following what you're doing to make sure what you're using as a process to reach people is effective and so you're spending 
spending ultimately because you have to spend money spending it in the right place whether it's time or whether it's money or whether it's advertising revenue so things to do um and then i think the other thing is is i always i always remind myself about the perseverance side there's a little marketing maxim i came across years ago which really helped me which is it takes seven points of contact to make a sale um and so that idea the fact that you might make a phone call, send an email, follow it up with the brochure, make another phone call, perhaps go and see if someone have a first meeting, follow that up and then have a second meeting with them again before you might actually get to the point where they say yes, really helps sort of reassure myself when I'm sort of kind of going, no one's getting back to me, nothing's happening, it's nothing's going forwards, I wanted this to happen last week, I need to put this funding proposal into a match and, and just those sorts of stages to stage myself through, if you like, a little timeline when I get impatient and, I, and impetuous. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, amazing I'm more, I'm keeping on top of things so yeah that seven points of contact has always been a really useful one I keep yeah I, I think if you think about it in context with the the decision making process it makes a lot of sense because you've got to have become accustomed to the idea you're introduced to it and you're not always going to make that decision straight away so it's good to keep on nudging and reminding uh, because it might be the wrong time of year or it might be that they don't have the budget at that moment so I can understand that seven seven point thing yeah when you I like think about it like that nice to follow it up with the if not now when question or if not now if yeah not, then who as yeah. well when's the best when's the best time of, to get in touch you know, so that work that you've done can start to build and expand outwards yeah. as, as um yeah, as isabel was saying you know she's she's got a, a group of her teachers that she knows quite well which might not be right for her but someone else might be looking for that so again comes to that kind of like using the marketing as a tool towards broadening the network and and, and, and yeah. then supporting that network fantastic tip thank you um finally let's go to isabel um what's the best tip you can give someone who wants to get your attention and capture your interest as a teacher if you can solve a problem for me, that would be the way to get my interest. Amazing. If you, can, <laughs> if you can offer me something that I know I need in my school. So, um, you know, something that's enhancing. I saw something on the chat about somebody saying that they're offering uh, free school visits. Oh, my goodness, I want to know about free school visits because my children can't afford trips. You know, and if it's a oh, visit amazing. that can link in some way with a topic, tell me, and um, that would be incredible. Um, if if you can solve a problem for me around, for instance, my art curriculum, and um, you know, uh, so su supporting teachers or the fact that we're we're struggling to teach dance properly in school, and I'm worrying about that, or for instance, you know, the multicultural. Uh, and sort of diversity, which is a huge issue down here. If you if you know a group of people who can do something that that for me, then I am suddenly very interested. And I have to say, first of all, I'd look at that. Then I would look at the price, um, and and that that would yeah. be my immediate decision. And if the price is something that isn't okay, I will just delete. Fantastic! That's such a great tip. That's brilliant. Um, so now um, I think that about covers everything that we wanted to within the agenda. And uh, we're going to get on to the exciting bit of the Q&A. We've got about about 10 minutes at a stretch, I'd, I'd say, to get to rattle through uh, about 20 questions that I've, I've noticed that have come in. So um, here's the first one coming up on my screen. Uh, if sending an email to the admin address of a school what would be uh, best to put in the subject matter to help it get to the right person uh, the name of a specific teacher at the school the curriculum area it should link to um, the fact that it's free or what, what would be the best thing to put in the subject line of an email to grab your attention it would be the curriculum area curriculum amazing I think also, Roberta, and I think there's a real art to that about subject lines and thinking about subject lines. Um, and, and I would say yeah. I haven't hit on a complete answer. If you know the name of somebody that can help, you know, at times, yeah. um, just something that's got enough of a peak to get somebody to move it on. Yeah. And it goes back to that info app bit that you rely on um, a receptionist or a secretary or whoever to move that on. Yeah. Um, and then it's got to go into the right box. It's the same with old school days when we had pigeonholes. Yeah. You know, all the stuff went in pigeonholes. You then had to hope that somebody actually went to their pigeonhole to get the information to out. And, and I know teachers who yeah. didn't do that for six months at a time. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I have to, I have to say as well, we've got um, a brilliant webinar uh, recording on the website, the DCM website about uh, it's called Test to Success, and uh, Peggy's done some other um, really good email marketing um, techniques and tips webinars. So uh, they're all recordings on the website. If you're interested in subject lines and email marketing, then definitely check Peggy out because she's awesome. So someone else asks, are flyers uh, as useful as brochures? I think it's another one for you, Isabel. Yes. <laughs> Basically, if it's something <laughs> that can sit on my desk for a little bit, because I might be dealing with all sorts of other things, but then I will have a look at, or I can put up in the staff room, then yes. Brilliant. Can I just Next. add to that and say, oh, yeah. um, but when I worked at the Connected Learning Centre, we and we were all about digital, but we always produced a brochure that went into schools, printed material. But we also produced a poster that could be put up in the staff meeting so other teachers could see it too. That proves quite helpful. Amazing, yeah. That's a really good point, actually. A poster or a calendar or something useful that they might use. Um, another question here. Um, how do you suggest finding these groups on Facebook? And um, yeah, how do you how do you suggest finding these groups on Facebook? That one's to Julia Rams. So I predicted that this one might come up. So I, I did some searching yesterday because I'm a member of quite a lot of digital ones, but I just put in drama, primary, drama, secondary, and lots came up and lots with music as well. And um, uh, yeah, so just, put it into the search and you'll find them. And I'd have a look at the Enact one as well. And someone asked if you can join them if you're not a teacher. I think if you've got something to contribute and you can make the case in the sign up, they let you join. Um, yeah, because it is about give and take. So as long as you, yeah. you're going to be an active member of that group, I think it's fine. Yeah, I think that's a good point actually, because if you've got something uh, valuable to add to a discussion, then they're gonna want you in the group because it makes the group better. Um, so the next question I've got here is, um, uh, I wanted to ask about schools magazines. Do you think schools find digital email marketing more useful than print marketing in magazine subscriptions? Um, does anyone want to take that one? To me, that sounds very much, I, I, I think it's what's come across so far, it really depends. It, it really is about, yes, digital marketing works, but it needs to be supported with print. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, Isabel is really clear about that. Something Having that can go on a wall, something points. can go on a desk, that helps. Yeah, brilliant. Is it worth having a termly e-newsletter going out to schools with updates on what we've been doing or what we're offering, etc., or are teachers just so swamped with emails they don't want to read them? So probably another one for you, Isabel, <laughs> picking on you now. <laughs> no, I, th I, th I think that's that's quite useful. If you've got the name of a teacher who's shown interest in something, I think that would be that would be good because just because at a particular time, like for instance, you know, just making the decision about the arts mark, I, I had all the information and just felt overwhelmed at the time and felt I couldn't move forward for different reasons. Yeah. But then if you go back to it a little bit later, you're like, oh, actually, I feel in a better place for that now. So I think if you're getting um, a digital uh, newsletter, it can just remind you it's out there and that you could tap into it when you need it and when you're ready to take it yeah. on. Isabel, do you find that you, you work seasonally with booking things or do you, do you get it done all at one time of the year or do you have to plan a year in advance? What's the what's the schedule look like? I think, I think we all vary quite a lot. Um, summer trips are always um, good, so trying to book those in. Um, I like to personally, at the end of the year, start to plan them all for September for the rest of the year. But um, to be honest, it's the individual class teachers who are booking. Yeah. They know what their topics are. Um, so it's trying to sort of get, get, get to them in time. But definitely for teachers, they will start booking them from September. So I think okay. any information coming into them in September would be really good or just before we break up. Yeah. That's brilliant. And I guess exam times and that kind of thing are a no-go area. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Um, so another question here. We have free virtual sessions, but struggle to get the word out to teachers. How can we put our resources in front of the teachers who can book? Oliver, have you got any tips for this? Are you good at doing this sort of thing, putting, getting the right person? Uh, I don't 
Uh, I suppose no, the, the simple answer is that we haven't done that. I mean, in, in a way, when we started producing our virtual sessions in lockdown, we already knew who our audience was, if you like, we, as part of the programme that we're delivering. Um, so we were making with the children that we knew in mind uh, and yeah. then platforms that the school already had to start that distribution straight out there. So we weren't trying to generate it. Um, uh, I think there's other thing is like, but around that, I'm conscious that there is, we all kind of actually have a much bigger back pocket of, uh, of experiences and things and offers that we can just put yeah. out there for free to help support marketing and, and sometimes reuse whatever the platform, whether it's Vimeo or YouTube or other things to, to, to help promote and generate some awareness in that kind of way. Um, yeah, so, yeah, sense. I think, think, you know, I try, I suppose I try to re remove some of the risk around that type of audience development by sort of knowing that it's there already or it's rich, it's sort of structured in already um yeah. because when you're operating in a kind of small to small level you're not thinking globally in that kind of way you want the platforms to do that if it picks up or not yeah. um it's about keeping it contained yeah and i think some of the tips we've actually shared already today will help you structure some strategies for for getting yourself in front of the right people as well some brilliant things have been shared today so far I've um, got time for a couple more questions. Um, we recruit uh, for our film and TV talent developments. Sorry, I'll start again. We, <laughs> we recruit for our film, TV talent development schemes primarily via schools and colleges. What is your advice for the best method of recruitment, live talks or digital information educators can, uh, the, edu the information that um, educators can distribute? So I think they're asking, what's the, uh, what's the best way to recruit the film and TV talent development schemes? Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't free. Um, I think, Roberta, the first thing is, is that notion, when we're working with schools, we've got to be clear of what our audience is. So is it the teachers? Is it, is it the young people? Is it the families by yeah. extension? If it's young people, then we then you use teachers as the mediators. You know, they're the ones who are going to pass that on. Um, so I think it's it's always really important to, to be clear about that audience and then construct what you're doing appropriately. Um, so it's it's an appropriate email to the teacher that will then pass on if this is about, you know, recruiting talent for the future, pass that on to the relevant students. But as you move down to kind of say filmmaking, digital, you start to narrow the focus in terms of the number of children, the number of teachers who are in that space, particularly at a secondary level. So I would be then looking at the media teacher, the film studies teacher, um, if they have them, potentially art and photography teachers, you know, so a lot of schools yeah. won't be that specialised. Um, uh, yeah, and, and having that tag as clearly as you can. Yeah, that makes loads of sense. Um, I think we've got time for about uh, one or two more questions, and I'm going to ask this one to um, Isabel. Um, is is there a, an optimum length of um, time for a school's webinar? Yeah, probably an hour. Um, I think some of them we do are two hours, but to be honest, it's, it's a limit to how much information you can take on. So I think at an yeah. hour is perfect. So if you're designing these sessions, schedule, you know, just try and make, make something for about an hour. And, and then chunking, <laughs> chunking within that as well. So thinking about the rhythms and patterns within that, you wouldn't deliver a lesson solidly for an hour. There would be rhythms and, and, and a mix of, of kind yeah, of approaches. Really so point. thinking that through. And do you schedule in little breaks as well, maybe? I don't know. The, I suppose it would depend on the, um, the age of the children, wouldn't it? Um... Do pushy parents' power have a role to play in this mix as well? <laughs> Is it worth reaching out to um, to parents to encourage encourage this mix, um, to encourage people to uh, schools to book on? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I think I think schools have got a very clear idea about what they can afford, what their curriculum is. Um, pushy parents, if they're out there, um, I haven't got any. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, we're quite happy for parents to inform me about something that's really good and share that information. Um, yeah. But I don't think a school would be led by parent 
Yeah, um, so, parent power. Well, I mean, parents <laughs> might, you know, for instance, I paid for all of my junior children to go and watch, um, go to the Minac Theatre um, yeah. because they wouldn't have ever be able to go otherwise. Um, and parents were very grateful for that. So you might have uh, parents suggesting that, you know, the children all go to the theatre or go to a show yeah. or something. Um, and it's something that we could consider, but again, it, it depends so much on cost that we couldn't be led by something just because a parent was suggesting yeah, it. Yeah, that makes total sense. Amazing. We haven't unfortunately got time for any more questions. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, share my screen and show you some final slides. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for, um, for your contributions today. It's been an absolutely brilliant um, conversation. Um, I just wanted to share these final slides with you. Oops, I don't know if I've shared it or not. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, brilliant. Um, so the um, the website is going to say have have all these uh, the recording and the resources. Um, uploaded as I said before. I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone that came along today um, and uh, it was really brilliant for us to, sh to share this experience. It's been really fabulous. Um, uh, the, the, there's going to be resources uh, about how to get in touch with uh, your bridge organisations in your local area. It's worth reaching out to them if you want to. Um, you can also get in touch with us at the Digital Culture Network. Um, and um, yeah, so all of this will be going out on the uh, um, Digital Culture Network website. Uh, this is the email address to use to get in touch with us if you'd like some one-to-one -one support or if you've got any questions from today's session. Um, and we would really appreciate it if you um, took, a, took a moment now to fill out the survey that pops up when I close this meeting. So um, very much thank you for everyone for coming today. I'm going to close the meeting now and um, I'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye.